So James, you've been hugely successful. You've um, you've set up a uh, a food business. Uh, you do lots of social uh, and ethical investing. But I want to start, if I can, at the beginning. Was there anything in your early life, in your school time, that would lead you to believe that you were going to become a really successful entrepreneur? Probably not. Uh, my parents um, were, my father was a school teacher and he got bored when he was 37 years old and left uh, with four young children and uh, found himself unemployed for the best part of a year. And in desperation, he started a coffee shop in Tunbridge in Kent. Um, and that sort of evolved into a cake baking business because he needed cakes for his coffee shop. Um, and when they um, when they uh, needed somebody to actually cook the cakes because uh, my mother wasn't up for it, um, they found uh, a good friend of my mother's who was the, sh the cook at a drug rehabilitation centre. And she made it a condition of leaving her job that she could employ some of the residents of her drug rehabilitation center. So they started this bakery um, whilst employing exclusively recovering heroin addicts, which uh, turned out to be a pretty challenging recruitment policy, but it sort of, it gave me this idea that you could use enterprise um, in, an, in an interesting way. And so did you get involved in, in the business when you were young? Yeah, so our school days were spent, or our school holidays were spent sort of as a barista in the coffee shop. And then as soon as I got my driving license, I became a delivery driver because it was easier money. So absolutely, we our sort of formative years, our teenage years were struggling entrepreneur parents trying to make it work. And, and how would you describe yourself at school? Fairly disruptive. Um, I, I went to a private school and it was... Um, very much saw itself as a kind of um, as a as a sort of feeder for the city. So I became really interested in the city and kind of there was this kind of big thing uh, 40 miles away, 30 miles away. And I didn't really understand what it did. What is the city? Everyone went into the city. And um, so I became rather fascinated by what the city was and learned quite a lot about sort of financial services and the operation of capital. Um, and I suppose I felt that the school was to some extent monoculturing people to become professionals in the city and I felt it was a rather reductive approach to education so that led me to ch challenge I suppose the school so I was quite quite disruptive at school. But there are some hints in there aren't there about your future life um, helping your parents in their business being entrepreneurial um, thinking about the city money I mean, th I mean, they they do play to what you went on to do. Yes, absolutely. And actually, um, you know, it, the minor strike was happening whilst I was at school and it kind of it was very interesting for me to sort of look at the and I studied economics. So at the time, there was a sort of very much and, st and actually still is um, a particular economic theory that's um, shared in economics classes. It's just one theory, but it sort of seemed seemed to become a kind of monoculture which was which was talking about sort of prosperity and um, the minus watching the miners strike and seeing kind of at the same time big bang in the city where uh, where the markets were liberalized um, so extreme wealth kind of being produced on the one hand with the sort of distress of the miners on the other led me to ask a load of questions and it was sort of the time of the end of history you know um, uh, Francis Fukuyama wrote that book. Um, talking about the sort of triumph of liberal democracy and liberal economy. And so it struck me that, um, you know, economics was in some ways the most important driver of society. So I became quite interested in economics. And in in terms of um, your your kind of desire for social enterprise, was was there anything in your childhood that, that I mean, obviously you, you talked about um, your father taking on somebody who was going to help recovering drug addicts. But was there anything else in your childhood that gave you this sort of feeling about a, a fairer society and trying to do things to help with social enterprise? Well, my parents were um, committed Christians, which meant that they had a very strong kind of social heart and desire to reach out to the excluded um, in society, which I think was a sort of formative part of their business when they, they employed these recovering heroin addicts. Um, and it kind of led me to this question around, 
you know what is the role of business um as as a sort of young person um and i suppose the other sort of um reference point for me was my mother's family had been pioneers in kenya and she was actually born in what was then british somaliland um and they were all about nation building and they were coffee farmers and subsequently coffee traders but they had a big kind of nation building um energy which again sort of suggested to me that there was a role for business and finance which went beyond just the production of more money so you were disruptive at school tell us what you did then well i sort of i suppose i just challenged the authority of the school because i didn't necessarily buy into its ethos um and that was uh that was not always a very um constructive expression um i think the school was probably quite pleased to see me leave i'm i think i was probably quite fortunate to remain there for the duration um but you know i had a, a, a and you know it was a wonderful place a wonderful on many levels it was a wonderful education it was a very well resourced school and um and i also found a crowd of like minded souls and we formed quite deep bonds and we're still friends to this day so it's it's left me with a really rich legacy actually and what came next for you after school so i went to manchester university to study economics and um i was taught that essentially we had invented the elixir um that uh wealth generation lifted all the boats you know as the tide comes in all the boats rise and the role and the role of business was to generate wealth and any sort of social responsibility or environmental responsibility wasn't something that business really needed to think about because it was a matter for government and regulation so government and we could trust government and uh, to regulate and that would leave business free to generate un unprecedented prosperity um, and that was what I was being taught in economics. But actually, the assumption in that is that all else is equal. And I, I remember sitting there in these lectures and my in my head was screaming that all else is not equal. You know, um, there is a kind of there is a fight. There is a finite a, a degree of natural resources that we can consume. And, and labor is not a perfectly mobile unit of production that you can just sh shift around like containers on a ship. And. So I became quite disillusioned with the course. It, so it was almost like just applied mathematics, just very, very sophisticated maths. So I um, I sort of left in disgust and uh, switched my degree to one of sort of social policy and political thought, which was, which was actually, for me, much more rewarding. Um, and, and again, that was another reference point. It kind of, it made me think, you know, the field of economics has become barren and is actually pursuing an idea which is, which is really quite dangerous. Um, yeah. And and so after university then, what did it, so what did that lead you to do? So you've now got this whole mix of of experiences and um and background and knowledge. So where did that take you then? Well, so I sort of had after that a fascination with um business um and what and what the purpose of business was and i did the milk round and i was very fortunate to land a job at cadbury limited in bourneville birmingham and um that again became a really formative experience because i joined this great quaker company which was really values driven um and actually you know the origins of chocolate uh, you know were that george cadbury was part of the temperance movement and he wanted to to create a product to compete with gin and the gin shops uh, which were devastating that Victorian society. So he created chocolate as a drink to compete with gin. So it's a really, you know, from the get go, it was a really social hearted business. Um, and whilst I was there, it was sort of essentially taken over by um, the investment community in the city of London, who uh, then, I, whilst I was there, they, they uh, implemented a program called Managing for Shareholder Value which effectively involved the extraction of all the values that got in the way of making more money more quickly by shoving more chocolate down more people's necks um, and uh, and actually led to the breakup of Cadbury and its subsequent sale to Kraft, which then led to a sale to Mondelez. So, you know, that business was essentially destroyed whilst I was there um, or, or the not not destroyed as a business because it's actually been commercially extremely successful and remains so but as something that was more than just an engine to make as much money for shareholders possible as possible and i thought that was a crying shame and not a very good thing for society more generally 
Um, so again, that left me with a with a big set of questions. And, and so, how did you answer those questions? Well, so I left Cadbury. Um, I, I kind of it, it lost me. Um, and uh, my mum and dad's business, uh, their cake manufacturing business, had sort of um, grown. Uh, it was still pretty small. It, you know, at the time, it was turning over about a million pounds, breaking even. But it was it was it was a train set essentially. And I thought, well, I'll. And they wanted to retire, so. I left Cadbury's and took over from my mum and dad running their business. And in parallel, about two years prior, my elder brother, Ed, had started a business called Cakes and Casseroles, um, which is what is now Cook. And he had um, and, 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 and I was really interested in, in uh, we were good mates, me and Ed, and I was really interested in what he was doing. So I took over my mum and dad's business and uh, we were supplying cakes to Ed's business um, and over a sort of few conversations we decided to put the businesses together so how is it working with your brother <laughs> uh, well I work with my brother and my sister and um, it's actually an extremely joyful experience um, although we've learned over the years that it's more joyful if we stay in our lanes and we all bring something a bit different um, we're very very fortunate in that on strategy and you know, long term, where the, what we're trying to achieve, we're fully aligned. So we we that's the sort of fundamental that we don't really have difficult conversations about any of that. Um, and to be honest, as time's gone on, we've got more, um, we've got a greater understanding of our own strengths and our own gaps and each other's strengths, and we've got much better at staying in our lanes and. Um, and allowing each other to to do what we do best. So yeah, it, it's been it's been a fabulous ride. Uh, in the early days, it was probably rather more um, rather more choppy than it is these days, but um, it was all good creative tension. You were talking about lanes, and I'm fascinated by that because quite often in in business, um, people think they have to do everything, and they don't focus on the things that they're really good at. They try and be better at the things that they're not good at. So, so how does the, the lane discipline work between you and your brother's sister? So in the early days, Ed and I kind of went into partnership, I suppose. Um, and my sister joined um, and she'd been working at, um, at an investment bank in London. And she sort of her rosy superpower is uh, culture. And she's extremely good at creating a safe and performing culture and, and sort of balancing safety and performance. Um, she's she's the best in the business. Um, and I definitely recommend talking to her about that. Ed is a Ed is an, an entrepreneur through and through. He's obsessed with the customer experience, the food, the offer, and also the kind of the, the, the how, how we can make it work from a kind of ranging mix margin point of view. So Ed's, if you like, the commercial engine. Um, and my my thing is more around the capital structure and the purpose and the long term um, stability of our ability to sort of pursue what we're pursuing. So I always kind of looked after the capital structure, the shareholders, the long term financial strategy, and um, which then plays into long term business strategy. Um, and that's kind of my lane. Um, and that's why now I'm co-chair. So I I run the board, if you like, and Ed and Rosie are co-CEOs and they run the business. Most of the people um, who pretty much all the leadership group um, prefer to report to Rosie than to report to Ed because that's what she's really good at. So she, she sort of runs the senior team um, and Ed is almost like an entrepreneur in residence um, and his report is the finance director and it works extremely well. And And... For all of those people listening to this podcast who are thinking, I'd like to have a go at setting up my own venture. From all of your experience now, because you've been on a, a long journey, 26, 27 years, what would you say are the highlights and what would you say are the things that are challenging and that people should be aware of and think about? The highlights are rooted in the fact that we make a product that is really good you know people the food is fantastic it's differentiated um and we're really passionate about it and that means that the customers typically are having a pretty good experience and that sales have never really been a problem um 
So having a healthy top line is kind of the lifeblood of a business. So in some ways, that's what that's the thing that's sort of driven everything else that's enabled us to hang everything else from it. Um, I think the challenges in the early days were all around how to capitalize it uh, because, you know, we we were very fortunate in the 2000s because there was a crazy credit environment um, and which we took full advantage of. So we used debt as essentially our venture capital because the banks allowed us to, which was extremely risky. So we lived for 10 years with um, extreme risk. You know, we were never more than a month or two away from oblivion. Um, and, you know, we threw everything into the kind of into the security with the bank. So we could have been completely wiped out, you know, if there'd been a in a bad event. And that was kind of stressful. And uh, we were riding our we called it our wiggly line. We had a daily we had a projection of our bank balance for 365 rolling 365 days in advance. We had an extremely sharp pencil, but we were crazy and young. And every time we saw a gap between our overdraft limit and our projected bank balance, we saw it as a budget to go and spend on a new piece of kit or a new shop or something like that. So we were we were literally deliberately riding oblivion. And I look back on it and I just think I just I mean, we were so naive, really. Um, but actually, it, we sort of we backed ourselves. As I say, the, the the product was sufficiently strong that the sales, the sales kind of got out, got us out of jail. And um, that enabled us to grow the business without taking, you know, we needed venture capital in truth. You know, it's quite capital intensive because we're manufacturing and we're retailing. So we're investing in a retail estate and a, and a manufacturing base. And um, and venture capital was what we needed, but we never took it because we didn't like the terms and we didn't like the transaction journey that that would have forced us into to sort of repeatedly sell or recapitalize the business. So, yeah, we did we did it that way. Um, it was really difficult. It was really difficult. And um, for somebody starting from scratch, I mean, you took over your your parents business. What do you remember about your parents in the early years when they were literally starting from scratch what what are your what are your reflections of of for them the the challenges and the opportunities at an er, even earlier stage so right at the beginning my father started this business and it was exclusively selling roast and ground coffee on the high street and i remember him coming home when i was sort of a teenager for dinner with his head in his hands in despair having and his takings for the day was 17 pounds and yeah he was trying to raise a family of four kids and so um it, they were difficult days and then he decided that he would open that his only choice was to open a coffee shop um in the site because it had a had an a3 planning uh, permission and uh i remember my mother's total horror like are you kidding? Because my dad couldn't even boil an egg. And she realized when he made that decision, she'd be having to cater for the good people of Tunbridge. And it wasn't kind of what she had in mind for her life. So I suppose what it taught me was that, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and needs must. And actually, you, you sometimes just have to do what you got to do to kind of keep going. And it wasn't necessarily what they wanted to do. But 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 just by moving forward and by finding a way of making ends meet it gave them the breathing space then to start shaping what they did want to do but it's incredible now looking back that you've built the business that you have built james with your brother and your sister i mean it's a it's a wonderful business you've got your own shops you supply supermarkets farm shops you've got a wonderful product you you must all look back with huge pride on on what you've achieved over the decades now Absolutely. It's but it's not about us. You know, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, one of the things that we've learned is that people are amazing. And uh, actually what Cook is, if it's anything, is it's a culture, which is what Rosie really uh, creates and curates, um, where which is a platform for leadership for many people. And actually, if if you're able to create an environment where people can um can embrace their own leadership potential and put it to work in a way that they really believe in that they think is really useful and valuable then it's extraordinary what people can achieve so in some ways i sort of see cook as just getting started because now there's 1700 people in the business um 
And the theory of change, if you like, is all about how amazing people are and how and what 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 we can achieve together if we if we organize ourselves and believe in ourselves. So so tell us a little about the culture of Cook and how you think it gives you competitive advantage. Well, one of our original ideas in the early days of the business is that people and, you know, it was a slight reaction to my economics degree. um, People are not a unit of production. (laughs) People are people. And they have cares and concerns. They have lives. They have one great, unrepeatable life. Each individual has that. Um, And how are they going to spend it? And selling labor, selling your labor or your time to something which you don't really particularly like or believe in didn't seem to us to be a very good way to live a life. So we always, from the beginning, thought of our people as people. And as a result, that's kind of informed um, everything that we've done. And... You know, we're not absolutely not perfect. You know, we're a work in progress. We, we, for example, still don't like the the, the what's called the living wage. You know, um, we pay the Living Fa- Wage Foundation living wage and have done for the best part of 10 years. But I still don't think it's really a living wage. And um, so, you know, there's and it's very difficult to pay more than that if you want to produce a product that competes against in a marketplace. So, you know, we've got a lot of challenges around what we'd like to be doing. Um and yet, you know, what we've been able to do with respect to both the um, the resources that we offer to our employees, but also the kinds of people we employ um, has has been something that I think has, everyone buys into. And it means that people show up to work in a slightly different way to a traditional I've sold you my labor kind of way. And and that's a, a good point for us to, to build on now your your other ethical work. And I think a good bridge into that is just to, to talk about the fact that, that Cook is a B Corp, B Corporation. So for our listeners, can you just explain what a B Corporation is and why it makes a difference to Cook? Yeah, so the B Corporation movement came about as a sort of response to this idea that had sort of landed out of this monoculture of economic thinking that a business's purpose is to maximize its profits because that's the highest role it can play in society Um, but actually there's a lot of people that would say that business as an employer as a consumer of resources um, as something that affects community has a much bigger footprint than just for its shareholders so how can we um, how can we almost reinvent business so that it is genetically um oriented to serve everybody rather than just to serve its shareholders and what the b corp does is it kind of formularizes that so you have to change your articles of association so that your directors uh, the direct the duties of your company director is not to maximize value for shareholders it's to create value for everybody uh, workers communities and the environment alongside shareholders and their job is to balance the interests of those different stakeholders so it's done through the legal constitution of the company and then there's an assessment called the b impact assessment which is like a quality system for helping you to understand whether you're doing that um, and so you certify as a b corp and then you join a community of businesses who are pursuing the same idea and it's one of the organizing ideas of this alternative is collaboration rather than competition so we'll collaborate with each other to learn about how we can be a better employer or how we can reduce our carbon footprint or how we can get to net zero or whatever the the issues are. We have sort of a a load of friendships uh, and relationships with other businesses who are all trying to be better and sharing best practice and those kinds of things. So it becomes a really strong energy as well. So moving from that to all the other work you're doing in terms of um, uh, investing, uh, social fund investing, et cetera, and it's been quite a long journey for you. I don't know if I've got the pronunciation of this right, but um, I think it was in the early 2000s you became involved with uh, Panapur. That's right. Um, and um, also you, you've set up other funds and involved in the other funds. So so if can you just talk to us about how you got involved in, in social investment, social enterprise investment, and, and what you do today? Yeah, so it comes from the same idea, which is that, uh, you know, conventional investment seeks to maximize its profits and it doesn't pay any consideration to the social or environmental impact of those investments because it's not been asked to. You know, as long as it's lawful, the fiduciary duty is to maximize the interests of the shareholders. So that's how conventional investment has been designed to work. And for good reason, because everyone bought into this 
this idea that government would protect society. But actually, over the last 50 years, you can see that government hasn't done a very good job of protecting society and businesses streets ahead of regulators. So actually, business needs to internalize the responsibility. Um, so that's kind of the organizing idea. So if it works in business with with what we're trying to do at Cook and with B Corps, it sort of also needs to work for investment. Um, and actually, the the best way I've heard it put is um, the, there's a the father of one of the fathers of private equity is a chap called Sir Ronald Cohen who founded a business called Apex Partners, and um, he talks about how in the 19th century we invented returns, and in the 20th century we started to understand risk, so we created risk adjusted returns. Um, but actually, if you ask an investment manager now, they don't really know about social environmental impact because they don't ask about it because it's not their job. Um, and I, our view is that you need to make it their job. So so the future of investment, the future investment product will be about risk returns and impact. And actually, it's a much higher quality product to offer investors. So the work I've done through Panapur and we, cre we co-created an investment firm called Snowball is to model what an investment company looks like when it's metabolizing the social and environmental impact as well as the risk and return and then making investments into into pretty much every asset class and and just going back to um helping people listening to this who might be thinking about setting up their own business what would your advice for them be on raising capital so i I was listening to the founder of Mumsnet on one of your previous um, podcasts, um, and it was very interesting what she said about how she was offered four million pounds um, and, and and the deal fell away. And she ended up sort of doing it in her bedroom with a couple of colleagues um, on a shoestring and finding the audience. And I suppose my first piece of advice or my the fundamental piece of advice is to the extent you can. And it's I understand it's not always possible, but to the extent you can build the business yourself with everything you can scratch together and establish your sales and your, your kind of model um, before you go to get investment capital. Leave it as late as you possibly can. And the more patient you are with respect to growing your business, uh, then the, the more power you will retain over what you're trying to do and the, and the less power you'll have to give away to investors who might not share your goals. No, that's great advice. That's great advice. And and James, tell me what's next. You've you've done you've achieved so much both with Cook and all that you've done with ethical investing. But but what's next? Well, you know, we believe that we believe that we've got ourselves into like taking a step back. Um, as a society, we've got ourselves into a bit of a pickle because you know there is a series of challenges that are quite substantial and are going to come and bite us in the face if we don't address them. Obviously, the climate and biodiversity crisis, but also the inequality crisis and the sort of the the, the lack of trust in society. And um, we are convinced that if you're able to internalize responsibility for what you're doing rather than outsourcing responsibility to government then you show up differently and you create a much more joyful environment for people an environment of trust psychological safety where people can really start to achieve what they want and it just it leads to different outcomes that are much better and stronger for society so what's next is 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 figuring out how to take that that idea um and and um, encourage others to see that idea to the extent we can. So within Cook, you know, we're part of an unsustainable food system. You know, you'll know all about this, Mark. Um, it's very problematic. And, um, you know, things like soil health and um, uh, an ocean health and uh, what food is doing to us as part of nature. So kind of obesity crises and those kinds of things, inflammation, the impending crisis in the health service with, with all of these chickens coming home to roost. So we're looking at Cook and, and how can we transition into a truly nature positive food business, um, both from where we buy the food from and what the food we produce does to our customers. And we're starting from a really strong place. You know, we're 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 miles ahead of most food businesses because we've been able to be um, independence. To do that, we, we have to stay independent. So we designed in at the very get go some fundamentals that, to the business which will help us remain independent so we we have 100 shops we have a thousand concessions we don't have any customer who represents more than about seven percent of our sales so we can't just be told what to do by a customer 
we don't have venture capital or institutional capital, so we can't be told what to do by an investor. So we really have tried to remain free to to pursue that. So so Cook's all about the food system. The B Corp community is all about you know sharing this idea with business that actually it's just better. You know there was a report published last week by Demos, the think tank called the Purpose Dividend, which talks about the billions. The, the tens of billions of pounds that doing this creates in value for the for society. So I think that, you know, the way that the way the world's going, we need all businesses to change their purpose. So they internalize these responsibilities and likewise with investment. Well, you're certainly um, the flag carrier for all of that, James. Uh, and if I may say so, you've, you've done an incredible job. Um, uh, I love your food um, and uh, you've built a great business, an ethical business. And to see you helping other businesses through what you're doing with your social funds is just remarkable. So thank you for everything you've done, but also thank you for joining us on this edition of the podcast. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me.